Okay, welcome. Um, I am John Akuma. I am the um, executive editor of Stop Motion Magazine. I'm also the head instructor for uh, Stop Motion University. And um, I am presenting uh, this class to you. Uh, this is our lecture for the um, beginners. Uh, well, no, sorry, there's two different courses. <laughs> this is the uh, animation producing essentials. There are so many courses going on right now in my brain that I'm kind of uh, all over the place. But uh, the good news is I'm pretty organized when it comes to the courses themselves. So this spe specific course is to focus on um, the animation producing essentials of uh, production and also working in the industry. So this is a business class, basically. Um, we're going to cover, I'm going to go deeper into this. First, what I want to do is just introduce you to the website, introduce you to um, the course overview, um, show you how to access the course itself, and then we'll dive right in. Um, the lecture is probably about an hour, hour and a half at most, and um, we should be able to uh, cover quite a bit here. Um, first thing to notice, to note, and let me share my screen here. Uh, share screen, and we'll go here to my desktop. Let's share my desktop. Uh, the first thing to note, and I'll put my camera over here so I can talk to you. Um, first thing to note is that uh, this is a uh, online course. Um, we access the course through the internet and use the stopmotionuniversity.com website. Um, that being said, uh, you will also, as a student, will have interaction with me in the course. We will be able to communicate through email, also through uh, messaging, and we'll also be able to communicate through the actual Zoom classes themselves. So if you feel like you are um, behind, or if you have questions, or if you want some inside information um, that you really can't get uh, through the actual uh, modules themselves, you'll be able to access me and be able to communicate directly with me and, and I should hopefully have an answer for you. If I don't have an answer for you, um, I worked in the industry for 20 years, I, in the animation industry and television and film, and also in music, um, I'll be able to find somebody that has the, has the answer for you. It might take me a second, but I'll be able to get the answers for you. So, okay, next, let's look at the website. So the address for this is basically stopmotionuniversity.com. Um, we will be able, you just go here and you should be able to log in either here or under student access, there's a login and log out. Under the log in menu, there's actually a registration button. You can register there to register an account or start an account. Um, you also can sign on if you haven't already bought the course. You, will, you can buy the course through our shop page under products and be able to um, get whatever course you want. Uh, this is the Animation Producing Essentials course. Like I said, it's our business course where we focus in on how to work in the industry as a producer or director, or even just as an animator working in the industry and, and kind of dealing with a roller coaster in production. So um, then once you've done that, once you've signed on, you should be able to access under here your profile. Okay, this is my profile specifically. I'm the administrator and head of the school. Um, what, what you have here is basically a bunch of different functions to be able to go to different pages and stuff. What's, it, what's important here is there's, there's about two or three different buttons that you wanna be able to go to um, and be able to access the course. For one, um, you can definitely send messages to people. You can friend people on the course. And then there's groups that you will have interaction with the other students. Um, and then forums, of course, uh, where you will also be able to interact and, and post questions and, and communicate. And then the courses themselves specifically, when you click on this button, it should take you to a list of courses that you are already enrolled in or already assigned to. So that way you can be able to um, basically go to and pop around in the different courses that you have joined or you, have, or you are in. Right now we're in the summer 2020 session. Uh, this started this last week. And there's a bunch of modules to actually go into and learn as a student. So you should be able to feel free to have access to that and not be burdened by, um, by just having to attend the lectures. Okay. Now, what does the modules look like? What do the modules look like? Um, any animation producing essentials, you'll see here, there's a list of different areas that you can click on and go into um, from how to use the website to uh, the world of animation, production environments, the ideas, script, storyboard, development and concepts, animation technical knowledge, the pitch, production is business essentials, uh, client artist relations, pre-production, production, post-production, post distribution, working and staying relevant, and final quiz. Now, this lecture itself will actually sit within one of the modules. And as we go through for the paid students, the students who actually bought the course, we will um, we'll have you'll have private access 
to all this content. Whereas somebody that hasn't paid for the course, this is the only thing they get. They get the lecture, this first lecture for free. Um, but after, after this lecture, it is a paid course. So those students that haven't joined should join and want, who want to join should join. It's not an expensive course to take, by the way. And uh, I'll cover this a little bit more as we go, but it will sit within the module itself and you will be able to learn and be able to um, go at your own pace. Now, um, let me jump into this really quick. Hold on one second. Let me make sure that we have all our participants. Yeah, okay. And then um, let us start with, here we go. So what is this course? These are my, my layers of questions for you, um, or, for myself actually. What is this course? Well, this is a business course. So how do I put it essentially to you? Um, if you work, or you want to work in animation, there are some key essential things you need to know. And a lot of those things are not taught in colleges. Um, a lot of those things are taught only in business schools. And uh, that becomes, a or business classes, that becomes a major, major issue for most of the people that I've known that have worked in animation. For one, um, dealing with contracts and dealing with um, how, to, how to get work. Those are two major questions that I get asked all the time. Um, I actually, I've, I've battled in uh, production with producers and with uh, executives and with directors. I've battled with lawyers in one many times, actually um, in, in contract negotiation or in dealing with closing a production. So what I want to present to you here is a course that has an overview. So we actually will, will cover what is a production? What are the fine pieces that you, we need to be concerned about? And what are the things that we don't need to be concerned about so much? So. That is one of the key essential things there. Then we go deeper into um, how, does, how to look at uh, a production in the sense of a money-making profitable venture. Because if we do a production and we lose money, chances of us doing another pro production are very slim. So every single time we do a production, we want to make some kind of profit. If it, if it has to do with materialistic profit or if it has to do with economical financial profit, it is very, very essential and important that we understand that we're making money. Um, if we are just doing this for artistic reasons, we need to actually understand what the limitations of our budgets are. How do we schedule these things so we can move on to another pro project, a personal project, so to speak, or how we can um, advance this project to a point where it's not just artistic, but that it's done in a way that um, we get the most benefit from it in quality and our expression. It's, it's not essential. So where will this class be held or these lectures be held? 100% online. Um, the class is, the school is actually 100% online. Uh, like I showed you on the website, uh, it will be at stopmotionuniversity.com and you will be able to um, access the course uh, through through the website and then also access the lectures the what are held through Zoom um, that are private for paid students uh, on the actual um, uh, class itself uh, through we will I will email you those uh, per week and then you will actually be, be able to access that and be able to um, interact with me and take the lessons and we can go through a whole process. Um, how long is it? Uh, well, the lectures are actually six weeks. The course itself can be taken up to one full year. So once you've signed on and once you've joined the course, you can take the lectures um, either live or recorded. Uh, they, they will be recorded. So if you don't have access um, to a, a, the time per period and the time frame that they're actually being held, you can go into the website and view the recorded um, lectures. And also, so anyway, so six weeks is the lecture length. Uh, within that six weeks, you should have enough knowledge to actually take the final and earn your certificate. This, this course is not just a, I'm going to take this, 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 this course and not get anything out of it. You're actually going to earn a certificate in Stop Motion University um, and be able to put that on your resume or put that on your LinkedIn or whatever else that you've had training in producing for animation. Uh, for me, I think it's really essential as a person that, I've, that has gone through the process of going through trade schools and through universities and through colleges, junior colleges and such, um, that going through and getting the knowledge is really, really key, essential. Understanding that you understand the knowledge is even more essential. And that's where certificates come from. And that's where diplomas actually come from. It, other, at the end of the day, it's really just a piece of paper, but giving you the reassurance that you've actually learned something is actually key here. Um, what will you learn? 
Okay, so you're gonna learn producing. Uh, that's the first thing. Uh, that's the core of this class is actually producing. There's not a lot when it comes to, um, in, in the sense of courses out there, when it comes to the sense of animation courses for producing. Add to that, there's nothing for stop motion at this time. So uh, this is a stop motion producing course that also can be applied to animation as a whole. We will cover a lot of animation aspects. In fact, the principles and the, and the methods that we use for producing for stop motion are the same ones that we use for just producing in animation in general. So 2D animation or CGI animation. Um, stop motions, we also call it model animation or um, people like to call it dynamation or claymation, whatever you call it. Um, it is something that uh, a lot of people love. Uh, people seek out, producers um, in, and agencies seek out stop motion for their productions for commercial, music video, television, and film. So those are the four factors that we actually uh, address in this course. Um, but we also will go even deeper into, um, in, into other aspects of like per personal um, courses where we're, we're um, allowing our, let me, let me change this here. Allowing our, I just let somebody into the room. So give me one second. Um, it says host, but I don't see my image up there. There we go. And uh, we we'll, we allow our um, production to actually advance in a way that will be beneficial, not just for us, but for also, also our audience. And doing a proper production where we actually have a, um, a number of, of abilities to be able to, um, to harness the raw power of our brains and also harness the, uh, the time frame that we have. Time, time management is a, a key thing here as well. So we're also gonna cover time management, organization, scheduling, budgeting, um, dealing with a crew, what to do, what happens when things go wrong and all this other stuff. Um, that's really where it comes from. Okay, so what is the value of learning this stuff and who cares? I mean, Honestly, I think producing and directing a lot of a lot of people within the industry, within stop motion, within animation, um, even in live action, will um, that are not working professionally, that want to work professionally, always sidestep the producing side of things. They always sidestep that. They go straight to directing. And let me just tell you, a director knows how to produce, and if a director doesn't know how to produce, chances are they are. Um, very limited by what they are capable of doing. And what that means is um, education, uh, having the knowledge of how a producer works and how a producer functions, that alone is extremely valuable because what we're truly talking about here with, with producers is core essential things that will benefit your life on a daily basis. Okay, now let me repeat that. These are core beneficial things that will benefit your life on a daily basis. Um, for example, time management. It's extremely important as an individual to be able to manage your time appropriately. You throw children into that, meaning that you have kids. Not everybody does, but you throw kids into that. Your, ma your time management becomes just more and more important because children actually eat up a lot of time for taking them to school, feeding them, uh, changing diapers, whatever, playing with them, you have to spend time with them. And so your time gets shrunken down and you have a limited amount of time to actually spend to invest in what you're doing. Uh, that is, that is a, uh, a very important thing. Throw school into that, okay? Forget the kids, no, you don't have kids. Let's say you have school. Well, if you have school and you're trying to do production, it becomes a nightmare as well because your schedule has to go around the other schedule. You have two different schedules going on. So that's, that's another one. Um, life in general uh, scheduling. Let's say you don't have any worries. You have all the free time in your life. Well, sitting around on your butt playing video games is not going to get your production done. So a big part of that is scheduling in your time for leisure and your time for um, doing production. Those are, those are a bunch of different things that are actually really essential to, to getting the times and um, that will work for you and making sure that you have a good amount of uh, production time. Essential. Well, who cares? And I mean, I kept that at the bottom. And that's something I hear a lot, actually, in um, animation, in the animation world. And I've seen a lot of productions fall and falter and, and fall apart. And I've seen people jump into the producing role. They have no experience before. And they've been blacklisted in the industry. There's a lot of things that you need to be aware of um, as a producer and as a director 
to be able to accomplish things. And really what we're talking about here is communication. Um, that's the core essential part of animation is communication. If you cannot communicate, um, you will not succeed. But let me rephrase this. Um, if you've been horrible in your life at communication, if communication is terrible for you, you, you just feel like you can't talk to anybody, you can't do anything in the sense of being able to um, bring people into your, um, uh, into your production, I got news for you. This class is gonna help you with your communication skills. And a big part of that is that uh, we are dealing with, um, shit, stop sharing my video here. Um, we are going to deal, oops, there we go. We are going to deal with, make me the head here, uh, pin video, there we go. We are gonna deal with um, communicating in a, in a way that will um, both give you patience because we need to learn patience as producers. Um, we will also be able to communicate as, uh, as artists, uh, being able to communicate to other artists. Uh, or non-artists, that's, that's another one. A lot of times we deal with people that are not artists, they're just business people. Um, and we'll be able to communicate with each other um, as dealing with, let's say your crew, um, talking about budgets, talking about contracts, all these different things. All these, all these different areas where a lot of times people will um, get lost in the production. And um, I'm, I'm here to actually give you a guide plan for walking your way through the course. Um, hi, Chad, how you doing? Um, I see you there and I let you in. We lost Ian for a second. He's there, but no worries. All this is being recorded and then um, shared on um, Facebook right now. So just in case you didn't get everything, you'll have access to that. And feel free to, to type into the chat area if you have any questions. I'm going to keep moving forward and let's see what's the next section here. Okay. Um, share my screen again here. Share. Okay. All righty. So here we go. This is the course overview of what we're studying. I've kind of covered a lot of this already. And then we're going to dive into, um, into some key concepts. And then I'm going to give uh, all the students a basic assignment for uh, the next class. So that way they can be up to speed and be able to do all the things that they need to do. Okay, so in the Animation Producing Essentials course, we're going to cover uh, Production overview, types of production, uh, that would be music videos, commercials, television shows, and films, feature films, or even short films. Um, we're gonna talk about stories. Where do they come from? That's a very, very, very important thing because if you don't have inspiration, you can't create. Um, building the story, how we build the, a story from an idea to script to concept to storyboards and then to completion. Then we'll cover planning, uh, scheduling, budgeting, how to deal with our crews, and what to do when things go wrong. And believe me, things do go wrong. And if they go wrong often, um, then you need to have ways of fixing those and addressing those issues so they don't happen again. Uh, we'll talk about contracts and production agreements. Uh, actually, we're going to cover a lot of key terms in contracts. Um, I have... Technically, I've been in the television and film industry for 20 years. I've been in the music industry since I was about 14 years old. I'm in I'm like 43, so actually almost 30 years, uh, 28, if I'm doing my math correct, 27, 28 years in the, in like the actual entertainment industry total. Um, and so I've actually dealt with contracts since I was at about 14 years of age. And um, there are some really, really basic things in contracts that scare and terrify people when they see them. They literally go, I cannot sign this contract because it has this in there. And honestly, it, a lot of those times when they say I can't sign it because of this, it me, or if you're afraid to sign a contract because it has some stipulations in it, it means you just don't understand what those stipulations there are or how to read those. A lot of times you actually have to explain to people and say, okay, you're gonna need to talk to a lawyer and get some basic advice. The good thing is there's free legal counsel out there or they can use the internet to search for things. So we're gonna cover some basic contract information. Um, some some overall uh, concepts, uh, production agreements. And also another thing to think about here in contracts and agreements is each state in the United States has different rules. And along with each country and each state within those countries has different rules. So I'm gonna help you find ways of determining what contracts are um, appropriate for your area and what you're doing. And then there's kind of like what's called a boilerplate contract agreement 
which we will cover also, which will cover your basis for the majority of the areas or the states that you're dealing with in the United States, along with places like uh, England, deal with England or or the UK or the European Union or even uh, Central America. So there's some different things that we have to address and uh, approach in a contract agreement. But in most cases, there's a universal language that we can, we can address. Um, stages of production. So we're gonna cover pre-production, production, and post. And I put on here pre, pro, post because um, we need to actually address each one of these separates so that way we can do um, producing in a way that will be beneficial, efficient, and get us to the, the deadline appropriately um, so we don't go over the deadline and have to um, do damage control. Uh, delivery, and thus this is where we talk about um, our deadlines, uh, meeting those deadlines, the formatting, how, what kind of formats we're gonna deal with, um, what happens, a lot of this delivery conversation actually happens in the post-production process. Um, because and we actually need to plan for it in the pre-production. Um, but the delivery process is different for each type of media format and each client. So every client is going to ask for something different. Um, I've never had a client actually ask for the same thing or two different clients ask for the same thing. It's never happened. Te even in television, uh, television production, a client will go, I want this. And you literally go, Okay, I can give you this, but I need this extra little information to provide that for you. So a codex, codex are a great example here. Um, when you're delivering a file format for a video or for a television show um, or a film, the package that the video sits in is key essential. The, the frame rate that it's shot at and then the scale of the video, key essential. So I will tell you, I will get clients all the time that will wanna start a production and have no idea what their delivery format is. So that's one of the things that we have to talk about. Um, how to find work, okay? Finding work in the industry is, um, for people that just don't know, is really, really difficult. Um, for the people that do know how to find work, there it's less difficult, it's actually a lot easier um, to put the, we say, put the feelers out there and get people to look at our work and then hire us. Uh, that is a big one. I'll tell you a secret here. The, the best way to find work is to be doing work. And that is, that is one of the key, key uh, secret ingredients. You need to be working to find work. But that doesn't mean you need to be working for other people. You can be working for yourself and putting yourself out there as, I just did this. And people will come to you. That's one of the things. But we'll go deeper into this. Um, that's part of the course. Um, how to find work is actually a, as a whole lecture. Um, so I won't go into it too deep, too deep right now. And then we have a final. And our final is actually a really, really um, just like a, a, how do I say? It's a multiple choice a question and answer, an essay, and then a final project that, we will, that you will submit. And that will earn you your certificate in the course. Once again, it's a six-week lecture. And then you have up to a year to complete the actual course itself. Okay. And let's get started here. So that was the overview. Um, some of the things that I need to point out to you are the softwares. Um, We're gonna get into screenwriting software. We're gonna get into, um, cause I'm gonna cover scripts, storyboarding and uh, production design, scheduling and budgeting. Um, some things to think about here is there is a lot of softwares out there, but the main software for script writing is actually Final Draft. Um, Final Draft is the industry standard for script writing. You don't have to buy this software right now. Um, I, they used to have a 30 day license, so you could actually get it for 30 days and try it out if you liked it. Um, but I will show you, and to be honest, Final Draft is so powerful that um, sometimes when I open it and I start working in it, I, I um, explore new areas that I haven't used before because there's so much to the software. Um, we will open it up and I will, I will give you a tutorial and a lesson in script writing itself. Um, all the essential things that you need to know to be able to get by and be able to, um, um, hold on, let's see, it's shared window to the front. I just do the shared window to the front. What happened? Oh, I have to, hold on, let's change this and let me share my window one more time. It said it was paused. Share, there we go. Um, so Final Draft is the software in the industry 
and it is a it is a key software to have. It's not the only software out there. And once again, it's extremely powerful. You'll have a lot of options and abilities to be able to do lots of different things in this specific um, software. And I want you to feel comfortable about it and not be able to um, to not to stress. Um, that is a that is a very uh, important thing to consider here. Script writing is actually really easy. <laughs> it's, it's not hard. Um, so I don't want you to. To feel stressed. Okay, so next next software to talk about is Celtex. Celtex is a free software. Well, it used to be free. Um, you can get a pro version for 30 days. There is a free kind of version of this floating around for older operating systems, which you can get like a hacked version or a open source version is kind of the term for it. It's not really hacked, but it's open source. But you have to go to a website that is not Celtex to actually get that. Now it is a paid service. So you do have to pay for this software. Um, it has a monthly fee, I think, but it's affordable. So if you don't want to pay for the um, final draft software, you can get Celtex and be able to get away with using this. Um, I use it on a commercial production that I'm on right now because my client um, didn't want to buy final draft and I needed him to go back and forth with me with the uh, collaborative, collaborative idea. He had a script in his head. I needed him to write that script. Um, it's just how it works. Um, I'm not the one creating that commercial from scratch, he is. So I'm having him to actually write the script so I can build all the animation and all the, pro all the props and everything and the puppets and whatever else. Okay, that being said, there is collaboration softwares out there that deal with scheduling and, and um, uh, budgeting and a shot assignment and production assignment. There's a lot of them. Um, one of my favorite of all times is called Smartsheet. And we will cover Smartsheet a little bit We'll also go into other softwares like Asana. Asana is another software that's all online management for production. Um, and then there's Monday.com, which is fairly new. I have never used Monday.com, but uh, I know a lot of people that actually like to use this software. So you see there's big companies tied to this software, they use it. And those are the, the ones that we'll probably be looking at, um, specifically Final Draft and um, Asana or Smartsheet. And then there's other softwares we'll go into as well. Okay. Let me stop sharing that. Stop sharing the screen. Boom. Okay. And, and then um, we're going to cover. Uh, give me one second here to get my preview windows up here. Um, okay. All right. So, first things first. Whoops. This window here. Give me one second while I get my screen adjusted here so I can actually show you some stuff. Okay, um, share my screen. And we're gonna go, oops, it's changed. Share my desktop, there we go, share. Okay, I'm sharing my desktop now, so you should be able to see everything that's going on here. Okay, let's go back, boom, boom. Okay, now, what I wanna talk to you first is, and we're gonna go into story, and then I am going to, um, I'm going to give you an assignment uh, for next week's class. Um, I sent an email to, to all the students that are in the class. Um, a few of them have tried to log in but haven't actually gotten into the Zoom because they were late. Uh, luckily, I caught Chad here. He's in the, he's in the Zoom with me. Um, and uh, this is being broadcast on Facebook uh, this, right now. So any students that are interested in taking this class or potential students interested in taking this class, they can see it and be able to sign up. Otherwise, um, this is the only lecture they get, but all the students that are participating in the actual course have signed up for the course will have access to the recording. So just as we go forward, I just wanted to mention that. Okay, so let's talk about concepts and where story comes from and how do we develop our stories. Now, the very first thing that I wanted to point to is um, adventures. And what better story than Adventure Time? You know, uh, what better world? This is, Adventure Time is kind of a mixture of all sorts of different um, elements that make up animation, that make up the world that we're living in, um, that we're observing, and then creating from that and being inspired by that to create otherworldly um, adventures. Adventure Time is probably one of my favorite cartoons. Um, I, prefer, I prefer this because, uh, using this as an example, because it's so close to Dungeons and Dragons. Um, I grew up playing Dungeons and Dragons, reading the Tolkien stories, 
uh, you know, The Hobbit and, and Lord of the Rings, along with all sorts of different adventure stories and, and science fiction and fantasy. So that's where I come from and my, where I look at for uh, inspiration. Um, but actually story comes from your observation of the world. So if you have an experience, you can write about it. If you don't have an experience and you have to make it up, it's harder to actually create. It's really strange. I mean, um, you, they talk about writer's block and a lot of writer's block actually comes from not being able to, to find inspiration or come from inspiration. Um, for instance, I put my picture over here on the side, hopefully you can see that. But for instance, inspiration is a, um, is a device that writers need to um, learn how to manipulate. Okay, so if you've ever heard a love song or a love story that really struck you at the core, chances are that that song or that story is written from somebody's personal experience. If you've ever read a love story that you go, eh, no, or heard a song, a love song, you go, eh, no. Chances are it's not inspired by love. It's written for profit and it doesn't actually have uh, something that, that um, inspired that writer. This is one of the biggest problems with writer's block. Now, um, creativity uh, in fantasy and science fiction needs to come from somewhere. And how we get from, from, uh, from nothing to something is we have to write from experience or write from other people's experiences, do our own research and read and look and, and explore. One of the greatest writers are, of all time, well, I should say writers, one of the greatest animators and directors and producers of all time that we, we know in, in stop motion is Ray Harryhausen. Okay, so Ray Harryhausen was inspired by many, many things. Uh, he started his early career as being inspired by um, science fiction, writing from like monsters. Hey, what if this happened? Or hey, what, what if that happened? And then later on, he got really inspired by Roman and Greek mythology. And the fact that he he went in this direction shows that he had an interest in what's called the hero's journey and i'm going to cover the hero's journey in, in a little bit but um what we look here at, what we're looking at here is um jason and the fleece this is actually jason and the argonauts a, a painting about that and um a legendary story he went on to actually make a movie jason and the argonauts based off of the legends of Jason and the Argonauts. So this story is actually thousands of years old. Hercules is another one that is a, a very uh, relevant story in our, or relevant tale in our history as human beings on the planet um, that we can actually look at for inspiration. Uh, going back to Jason and the Argonauts, Harryhausen went with a base core idea similar to the core ideas of Jason, Jason and Hercules and expanded upon it within his own universe. He created his own world and then added and embellished those stories and, to, and with another writer and with another producer and created this world, this magnificent world that became legendary in the stop motion industry and the stop motion world and also in visual effects and in horror films and fantasy films. So Ray is actually considered um, the godfather, the granddaddy of, of uh, these type of uh, writings. And also you go even further back, which was his inspiration or his mentor was uh, Willis O'Brien who created Mighty Joe Young, Lost World and King Kong. Um, King Kong is actually considered one of the best horror films or fantasy films ever made um, for a reason. Uh, because when it was made, it, was, it had visual effects and monsters and things, a story that had never been told in a sense. Okay, so that will, that will cover where we kind of can get information from how we build our story. And I'm gonna go into this in the next class, I'm very detailed, uh, we'll, extremely detailed actually, um, and we'll have a really intense class, the next class where I'll, where I'll discuss these as bullet points and we'll go deeper, deeper, deeper into the story and build a story. Okay, Joseph Campbell. Um, I'm throwing that name out to you. Uh, Joseph Campbell is a philosopher um, that's a researcher, a historian, a writer, and he, he basically went and looked at uh, history, at story, and at uh, legend, and psychology even, and built um, a structure of, or, or a breakdown of what makes a good story. 
And a lot of times we refer to this, most of the times we refer this, to this as the hero's journey. And what Joseph Campbell did was he explored ancient Greek and Roman and other cultures. He, he didn't just leave it to Mediterranean. He actually went to Asian studies and um, European studies for legend, even African studies uh, and Americas too. I, I, I wanna say he kind of covered everybody. He looked at everybody. And he built what would become the reference of the, the hero's journey, which is our reference for how do we build a story? So stories like Star Wars, are an ex the first one, the uh, New Hope. I'm sorry, I, I gotta line things up here because when we go into Star Wars, it goes all over the map and it goes a little crazy. But the original Star Wars, the New Hope, was a hero's journey. And then uh, Lucas infused that into Empire Strikes Back and Return of the De Jedi. Um, he just kept expanding on it. Now we're, because of Disney, they've changed the hero's journey a little bit and things get all, all over the place. But the core, core basis of the original Star Wars was the hero's journey, and we, it made for a great tale. Indiana Jones, um, that is a hero's journey. The Iliad, the basis of a hero's journey. Um, and so what is a hero's journey? Well, the problem that we come across here is that the hero's journey gets interpreted and changed and manipulated by the artist who is writing the story. And uh, also the person that interprets what a hero's journey is. There's some key things that are the same and there's some things that are, that are all over the map and very different. What we wanna focus here on is in the hero's journey is the core basic principles. So I'm gonna give you four examples here of the hero's journey and we're gonna pick out what the core essentials are for a hero's journey. And then after that, we can add to this wheel, this journey of the hero, our main character, our protagonist. Okay. So the hero's journey starts with, well, they're putting it on here in ordinary world. Um, and then we go to a call for adventure. If we look at the other ones, um, we have to start with a person. Um, fourth threshold, no, that's not it. Um, creation of the fourth, no. So basically the, the story starts with a person. It's not a listing it here on that one. Um, ordinary world, okay. So the, the things that we're looking at on these four examples, um, two of them point to an ordinary world. Well, that's not true to all things, but what we need to do is we need to relate to the characters. And that's really what it's saying here. So we wanna to relate to the person that we're uh, observing at the very beginning of the film. It doesn't, and it actually what's really interesting in like horror films like Scream, um, where uh, Drew Barrymore is the, the Muhar, the woman that it starts the movie, um, it's her ordinary world. We're in her environment. Uh, I can't remember if she's babysitting or not, but she's in a house and she's hanging out and she's by herself, just like you and me would do on a weekend, maybe all by ourselves watching TV or talking on the phone. And then she gets killed off in the first, you know, three minutes of the film and we're instantly taken out of our out of our comfort zone that's a device that's used in horror films um that was one of the films that was really was one of the big things that drew the audience in so we want to draw our audience in we don't want to necessarily kill our protagonist at the beginning but my, my point is it starts with something that we can relate to so either a character or a person or a place that we can go to and go okay ah i feel comfortable that being said, there's a lot of instances where that doesn't exist. So science fiction is a big one where we're instantly thrown into space. Uh, we're instantly uncomfortable. Uh, that draws people in or it pushes people away. Fantasy, we're put into a fantasy world that we can't really relate to and we have to build into it. One of the devices is to put things that are similar to our own lives into there. So eating, smoking, love, family, um, working. So those are, the, those are things that we can look at and go, okay, this will bring my audience into a comfort zone. Now I can take them out, okay? So we wanna to relate to our protagonist. Our protagonist is the main character. Our antagonist is the, is the enemy or the person that causes problems, okay? Um, on this first sheet, which is really good, is the call to adventure. Now the call to adventure means a call to adventure. It's that blatant, um, something has happened. We look at the next one, call to adventure, and we don't have any call to adventure here. We have the first threshold, sent. I don't see it on here, but it actually it's right here. There it is, ordinary world and call to adventure. The hook, whatever. 
here we go, call to adventure. Okay, so those are the, those four different examples, of course, point to call to adventure. I'm gonna tell you right now, there's this first one that we're looking at, this, this one here is pretty close to what a, a regular standard um, hero's journey is, by the way. This one and the last one. Um, okay, so the call to adventure can be many things. Now, what is the challenge? What are the things that um, cause us to basically um, have a need to do something, okay? Those things typically are challenges or um, the easiest way to, to do this is, is to explain it this way. The inspiration for battle or conflict, we're talking conflict here, which actually all stories mostly based off a of conflict. There may be some stories that you might read that don't have conflict in them and those are not very inspiring and sometimes are really boring. Um, conflict is what inspires. So man versus man, that's one. That's one conflict that we can write about. Man versus animal, that's another conflict we can write about. Man versus nature, man versus technology, or man versus environment. So those are the core. Once again, I'll, I'll do those over again so you can, if you wanna write those down or if you wanna um, take some notes. So man versus man, man versus animal, man versus nature, man versus technology, and man versus environment. Those are the, those are the core ones. And you could say environment and, and nature are the same, but actually, if you think about it, environment can be artificial. So virtual worlds or outer space, uh, whether inside a spaceship, those kind of things, and technology is breaking down, that's thus versus technology, robots, whatever. Um, okay, that conflict, will inspire your call to action. This is call to adventure here. I like to call it call to action. So when you're inspired to fight the enemy or there's a, a problem, okay? Then there's the refusal to call. Okay, so I don't wanna go. I have to stay home with my family. You know, that's a refusal to call. Or the denial. Um, for instance, uh, when uh, Luke wanted to go to um, study flight school or whatever that he was looking in Star Wars. That's a, that's a, I wanna go here. This is my call to adventure, but yet there's a conflict. Um, his family has been killed. So now he's really been called to adventure. He needs to, to avenge his family or to solve a problem, to get the message to Leia. That's a good example, Star Wars. The refusal to call is like, I don't wanna go, I don't wanna go, I can't do this, I can't do this. Um, I don't need to, uh, to do this, somebody else can do it. And then meeting the mentor, it's where he met Obi-Wan and was like, all right, I am, going to, I am going to learn from this guy. This guy's gonna be my mentor, he's gonna take care of me. Okay, that's, that's this wheel. Um, this one just goes cold, uh, cold adventure straight to threshold. Um, and we'll get into that in a second. Um, and then this one, of course, this is like a half and half. I, I, and the next one is half, most of them are half and half. There's, there's a variance in how we write, okay? Um, so the road to trial, and it's gonna be hard to see here. Let me, let me zoom in here so we can actually see a little better. So um, meeting the mentor and the road to the trial. So when you meet your mentor, um, they're the ones that are kind of inspiring you or pushing you through the door, saying, go go you need or you're learning from go go do the adventure um if we go here same thing in fact i'll stay on this wheel this is actually a really nice colored wheel that we have here so meeting the mentor and then crossing the threshold you have the ordinary world and you have the special world if we look at this other wheel the adventure is actually down here your ordinary world's here and your adventure is here okay so the majority of the story is actually in this um special world for this for this specific wheel. Once again, I'm going through these different wheels to kind of give you an, a, a, um, a perspective of how different people look at the hero's journey, okay? I'm trying to break it down for you in that sense. Okay, crossing the threshold. Um, how do I put this to you? So crossing the threshold is a way that we like kind of dive into the adventure. Now we're in it, okay? We've blasted off, we're in outer space. We've left uh, Tatooine, all right? Or actually, even better yet, we've met Han Solo, we're in the ship and the stormtroopers are firing at us. We've crossed the threshold. We're in the adventure, okay? Or 
for instance, Indiana Jones uh, running away. For, well, he's automatically in that Temple of Doom. He's automatically in this in the threshold instantaneous. So he's in that special world automatically because he's traveling uh, as we start. He's not in. He, his call to adventure is at the opening of the film. So we have a little different dynamic here in how that's written um, because he's jumped right in there and then the ball is chasing him down the down the uh, the temple. Okay. Um, so those are, those are two good examples um, of how the variance in story happens. We have two different things going on. Actually, you know, in, in Star Wars, uh, we get thrown into the story right away with uh, C-3PO and R2-D2 and, and Leia putting the little, the little uh, circuit into R2, and, or the hologram, and being able to do that. But really our focus for Hero's Journey more relies on Luke. So once we get to Luke, it's something. But Indiana, or instantly with Indiana. So, okay. Tests, allies, and enemies. And tests, allies, and enemies are one of those things that um, you'll see this a lot. This is where we introduce our uh, bad guys, uh, our, the people that are, we're going to run with. So thus the Lord of the Rings and uh, the Seven, that we're um, the Fellowship of the Seven that we're gonna adventure with, Fellowship of the Rings. Um, and then we get to the approach to the inmost cave. This is like the inner workings of the internal persona, the, the, the challenges like man versus himself. That's the biggest one um, I think that we have to deal with in any story, um, how to overcome ourselves. Um, if we go back, uh, they actually do approach. So approach is, like approaching the obstacle, okay? Um, and here we have the road of trials. Uh, the road of trials as, as uh, Joseph Campbell, and by the way, this is actually closer to, I think, Joseph Campbell's writing. Um, but the road of trials is, is like uh, trials and tribulations. So we can look at Frodo or Bilbo, and as they go through um, places like Mordor or um, just on the hero's journey on the trail where they have the challenges that they face, the orcs are chasing them down and there's just evil everywhere they have to face these challenges. And that's, that's really what that is alluding to. Um, the descent into the abyss is another good example. So descending into uh, like Dante's Inferno as, Inferno, as we descend into hell, each stage of hell as we go into it. Okay. Um, now, if then we have the ordeal. This is definitely the, like the challenge, go up here, ordeal, death, and rebirth. Um, so the person is struggling with themselves, struggling with the environment, battling with everything that they're facing. They have no hope to succeed. They are, they are gonna die. This is the, this is, and unfortunately, this is, really, this is really bad with these wheels, is this ordeal, death and rebirth is too early in the wheel. It actually, we need to squish the wheel a little bit um, to push all this towards the end. And the approach goes in the middle, by the way. So um, and I'll use my little arrow here. Maybe you can see my arrow. But the, this approach, number seven, actually goes down here. The trials and tribulation actually goes all the way here. Ordeal, death, and rebirth, like I said, is closer towards the end of the story. It's the climax or the build up into the climax, okay? Um, when somebody dies. So for instance, um, somebody that is a key character in the whole overall story for the journey is dead. Okay, if you haven't seen Star Wars, I'm gonna apologize uh, at New Hope because this is where Obi-Wan dies, <laughs> you know? He's been stabbed, he's with a saber, but we all know he has the force, the life force, so he can, he can become a force ghost and he lives on forever, but um, we don't know this at first. So he's morto, he's gone. And um, that section here inspires and builds up and, and gets us to our climax, okay? Um, a lot of people are going to say, no, that's wrong. No, no, no. That happens in the resurrection. We, we got the resurrection, blah, blah, blah. No, trust me. This actually goes further back in the story um, because all that other stuff happens really fast at the end of the movie. You get to like, let's say you're in a 90-minute a movie and you get to the halfway mark in the film. Um, chances are this ordeal, death, and birth, rebirth has not happened yet. It's actually further back. It's actually like two-thirds of the way into the film. Um, okay. So metamorphosis is this alteration and changing of the character. Um, so 
for instance, um, let's find let's find an example for you. Well, Luke finds his confidence after Obi Wan passes away, so he he becomes more confident and becomes to aspire to become a Jedi. He was inspired before, but now he's really inspired. He's going to go to the next level, the next level, the next level beyond that. He wants to, or uh, another one I love is Goku from Dragon Ball. Um, he learns he's got he's got super Saiyan power, and he can he can explode into this superhuman kind of character and, and fight finally, you know, and win. So the metamorphosis. Um, I'm going to leave this, this. So down here we have like, wait a minute, where'd it go? This ultimate boon. I'm not even going to touch that, but I am going to go here. So the reward seizing the sword. Um, that is a, and this is one of the problems with this wheel is we have a, uh, we have this weird kind of disconnect here. So our special world here and our ordinary world kind of lives more like this in some instances. I need to draw a wheel for you from my perspective to help them work. But, um, and then uh, if we, we get kind of this cut off, right? So our rewards, what did we do? We blew up the Death Star. Yay, we blew the Death Star up. Okay, or, um, or what's another one? Um, we, beat the monsters that, that turned to stone, you know? Yay, we beat them, we won, all right? And then now we have to do our road. Well, the you know, Hobbit's kind of hard, or not just the Hobbit, the Hobbit and Lord of the Rings is kind of hard because it stretches out over so many books. But the road back is actually um, the journey back to home. So we're entering back into our ordinary life. Um, and all films kind of do this um, to some degree. Tragedies don't, tragedies end on tragic notes. So we could actually hit the ordeal and never get the reward, or the reward could be our own death. That just depends on how we're writing the story. Uh, so we actually will never get back to normal in our stories. Um, depends on the story, like I'm trying to say. Um, Avatar. Avatar is a great example where a hero's journey is going through, where they have to get to the ordeal, which is fighting um, the, the hero is, is turned into an avatar to fight his own people and joining into the, the, the I think it's the Navi, I can't remember the name, I think it's Navi. And um, he fights and he wins and now they're on the road back to their normal lives. So now he, but he's now part of them. He's had his metamorphosis, his transition into a Navi and the fight and to win. Okay, so he's got that word, that resurrection and the return to the elixir or return with the elixir. So it's sorry, the magic potion. Um, uh, the magic, the reward, he's coming back. Um, so that kind of covers the wheel. I mean, this end area here is actually a lot smaller um, than this wheel portrays. This wheel is a little off, uh, but the beauty of this wheel is, and this is why I say people are gonna say I'm wrong, are actually um, wrong on them, themselves because this wheel can shift. That's the beauty of the hero's journey. You can shift the location of each one of these little areas, uh, each one of these fine points in a hero's journey. Just go on hero's journey, or go on the Google and type in hero's journey. You can find a wheel and then draw your own wheel for your design of how you want to design your story. Um, halfway points for ordeal, death, and rebirth. I can tell you there, there are stories that actually have ordeal, death, and rebirth for multiple characters throughout the film. So there may be more than one protagonist and there may be more than one antagonist and they pro and anti. Okay. And um, they will actually approach and deal with each one of these sections at a different time within the film. So you have to, you have to take this all with a grain of salt. This is, can be altered and changed to your whim. Um, but these key areas of the story are actually what matters. So, um, and each hero's journey wheel, for yourself, when you draw it out, he's gonna have different points. You're gonna look at them differently. For instance, the, whoever wrote this hero's journey had a lot of points, a lot of different things that they wanted to enter into their story. Okay, um, and I actually, I can't find the actual name. It's really hard to read down here, but it looks like it's referencing Joseph Campbell. Um, but there's, there's so many different things, elements you can enter into your own hero's journey. The other thing too is your ordinary world versus your special world can look something like this, where the line is a lot higher. Um, this to me makes more sense because you're gonna enter into that special world really rapidly if you're doing fantasy and science fiction. Okay. All right, so how does this play into, um, into dealing with uh, commercials and music videos? Well, I can tell you what, 
It doesn't. And this is specifically, this. you can use this, <coughs> and it is used as a device. But a lot of times, those are the exceptions when it comes to a story. They don't necessarily need to have a hero's journey to be successful. Uh, hero's journeys typically are found in television shows, short films, and movies. So you need to focus on that in those areas for this, or you can use this as a device for music videos or commercials. Um, a lot of times commercials are just like, hi, I'm selling you this. And there's a different journey in that. We'll cover that in the next class. But I wanted to give you something here to think about. Okay, now we're at the end of the class and I wanna to talk to you about an assignment. Um, and I, in fact, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna show you storyboards. So there's two here. There's a, 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 a section of panels from Box Trolls and there's a section of panels from the Fantastic Mr. Fox. These are, um, these are basically digitally drawn. Well, this one's digitally drawn, this is hand drawn. And what you're gonna need to do is come up with an idea. Come up with a story. Maybe you already have one. Maybe you wanna promote a product. Maybe you want to make a, a commercial of some sort to promote that product. Or maybe you wanna make a music video or a television show, a short film or, or feature film. Here we'll have a, um, here we'll have a, an idea of what somebody came up with for a specific scene. So for instance, this, these series of panels here, we have uh, the Fantastic Mr. Fox underground and he discovers, oh, wait a minute, there's a whole dinner happening. Oh, and let me do a cheers and blah, 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 blah. And we end up into a whole play. Um, okay, this scene is actually not just a scene, this is actually a section of a scene. When, we, when we're gonna come up with our ideas, sometimes it's beneficial, instead of writing the script right away, is to do what's called uh, um, a big board. Well, actually it's called, technically a small board um, because you're doing it on a small scale and eventually we'll get to a big board for production. But on a small board, you take sticky notes or you take a piece of paper and you just draw out your drawings for your different scenes. And these drawings will inspire you to actually get into the writing of the script or, the, or the, a synopsis of a script where you're actually going, okay, this is what my story is, these are my characters and this is what's gonna happen, okay? Um, let's go to box trolls here real quick. There's a lot more panels, but you can see here, they don't have to be super, super detailed, okay? This is not super detailed. This is really rough drawing. And, and um, these are line sketches is kind of the, I believe the term that we use for these, uh, meaning you can just scribble. So you can just scribble the images. As long as you can see what they are, that's all that matters. The other world, the other people do not need to understand what you're drawing. This is not for them, this is for you to inspire yourself to be able to create a story. So what I want you to do is come up with an idea. It can be anything you want, um, a minimum of 15 seconds long as a commercial. Music video would probably be just what, a three minute, two and a half to three minute. Um, a television show concept, you can do that as well. Or you don't have to draw the whole thing out by the way. Um, or a feature film kind of concept. I want you to write up really quickly uh, on your own, a this is my idea. It can be a paragraph long, a few sentences long. It doesn't have to be something major. This is for you. I don't necessarily need to see this. And then draw a couple pictures. They can be stick figures for all I care. It doesn't matter, but something that will inspire you. In fact, another way of doing this is finding imagery, and we'll talk about this more, finding imagery off the internet that inspires you. Make a folder on your desktop, stick these images in your folder that inspire you for uh, making your production. That's, that's where we start. And then in the next class, we're gonna go into story. Now I did, did, did cover the uh, hero's journey wheel here. I'm gonna have my own hero's journey wheel. We'll go through it super fast because in this lecture we covered quite a bit of it. And then we're gonna go into production idea, concept idea, uh, understanding character design, building from that and going into storyboards and uh, scripting. Um, we will probably cover scripting, a complete scripting class, the following class after that. And then from there we will get into uh, budgeting and scheduling and production and pre-production and that. Okay, I hope you like this class. Um, I'm gonna stop the share, but I am going to, um, I am going to uh, open uh, questions on the Facebook feed along with a chat. If you have any questions, please let me know. And then we can, um, we can really go from there. Uh, like I said, if you were interested in this class, go ahead and sign up for it. Uh, it is a business class for producing an animation. Uh, not just for producers, but also for directors and for animators. Um, I have over 20 years in the industry, so I should have a lot, of, a lot to tell you. Um, 
if I don't, then I'm a fool. Um, <laughs> but there's a lot to actually learn a lot, and I like to talk. So, um, and then uh, from there, uh, if you have questions or or you need to get a hold of me, you can contact me at contact at stopmotionuniversity.com. That is the way to get a hold of me. I'm available pretty much 24 hours a day through the email. I usually get back within either 24 to 48 hours, depending on my schedule. I am constantly in production. I'm constantly working um, as an independent artist. I don't work for studios. Um, sometimes studios will hire me to do specific jobs for them, but most of the time I am a, an independent artist. I make a living off of that. And um, I, would, I would definitely, I'm open to a, uh, answering any questions that you might have. And I look forward to those students that are gonna be taking this class to seeing you in the next class. We will be holding this class on Saturdays, um, just so you know. Uh, if you miss the class, it will be recorded and uh, we can, uh, we can you know, um, definitely help you out by giving you the, the link to those paid students that are actually taking the course. Okay, uh, thank you. And I look forward to uh, seeing you in the next one.